this morning in his keynote, Steve mentioned physics for physics majors. And this talk is going to be very much like that. Because in order to understand how range requests work, you'll first need to understand the innards of HTTP 1.1. So the HTTP 1.1 spec was ratified in June 1989 as RFC 2616. Now it was specifically designed to address various issues with caching, persistent connections, and so-called incomplete HTTP 1.0 implementations. What's intriguing is that despite having been a standard since 1999, the most popular web proxy in existence, Squid, doesn't actually support this implementation of HTTP fully. They're still working on adding HTTP 1.1 support and preliminary support was only introduced last year. So it's amazing how far this technology has progressed and yet we still need to keep in mind that many of the technologies we depend on, like proxies and caches, have yet to catch up. So I'll go ahead and briefly go over the HTTP request response model. In the most basic model, the client initiates the request and the server corresponding provides a response. Now what's important to note is that there's not necessarily a direct connection between a client and a server. Rather, it's a chain that includes a set of intermediaries. These intermediaries can include proxies, which are basically forwarding agents that rewrite the request in some way and forward it to its final recipient. Gateways, which translate an HTTP message to the server's underlying protocol, something that can understand in case the server doesn't understand HTTP. And finally, tunnels, which we can use in order to translate requests from one endpoint to another without the entity having full knowledge of what its contents are. Basically, uh, an entity doesn't need to understand HTTP in order to relay certain requests. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with Node.js. This is how we go about with creating a basic HTTP server in it. As you can see, every HTTP connection involves an exchange of messages between the, between the client and server or the request and response. So here we've got a simple handler that for every incoming request writes a 200 OK response. We'll be talking about the various response codes later. Implements a content type of text plane and a content length of 13 and then we send the actual body along. So HTTP is very much an application level protocol which means that it has to have an underlying transfer protocol. And in the case of HTTP, this transfer protocol is TCP. So this is how we can create a simple TCP client in Node to emulate something like Telnet or Netcat. Now it's important to note that Node has its own facilities for retrieving HTTP requests. We're just creating a TCP client so that we can actually inspect the raw HTTP messages being sent back and forth. So requests are initiated by the client and as you can see, there are two lines that I write to the socket. The first one is the method, the URL, the HTTP version, any headers, which we're not specifying, and finally the body, which we're not specifying here either. As you can see, we need to delimit these various fields with a CRLF, or a carriage return followed by a line feed character. So if we actually run this code, you'll see that it prints out something like this. The first line is the status line that contains the version of the HTTP, a response code, and a human readable reason phrase which debuggers and which debuggers can use in order to ascertain what precisely occurred. Any headers that are sent along with the message, in this case you can see the content type and content length that we sent, as well as some other headers that Node inserts automatically for us, and then the actual body itself. So the body is optional, as I demonstrated in the previous slide, and actually needs to be omitted for, for certain types of requests and responses. So this is an under the hood look at what an HTTP message looks like. So there are also various status codes that HTTP implements. The 100 level is primarily informational, 200 success is the one that we're most familiar with, and 206 in particular is one that we'll be looking at in more detail later as it involves a response for a partial GET request. We'll cover what that means later as well, don't worry. A 300 level response, which means that some further action is needed by the client, and 400 and 500 for various errors. Either a client error, meaning there was something wrong with the request that the client set up, or a server error, meaning that the server can't fulfill an apparently a valid request. What's important to keep in mind is that these are completely extensible. 
So clients don't need to necessarily understand the full range of HTTP status codes. They only need to understand the five categories. So now, now that we've looked at status codes, let's have a look at HTTP headers. This is the fully exhaustive list of HTTP headers as defined by the spec. Obviously, we're not going to go through all of them, but we are going to look at some in the general request, response, and end view categories. So general headers are applicable to request and response messages regardless of the entry being transferred. So for example, transfer encoding can be implemented on either the request or response. It doesn't matter, and the HTTP parser will handle that accordingly. Request headers are ones that can be sent only on the request. Response headers can only be sent on response, and entities apply to a particular body that we transmit, again, regardless of request or response. So this talk is going to be about range transfers, and if you notice, there's a confusing bevy of various names. If range, range, accept ranges, content type, content length, and transfer encoding versus content encoding. We'll go ahead and look at these in a bit more detail and try to disambiguate between them. So first up is encoding, which is a prerequisite for properly supporting partial range requests. So in this case, what, let's look at what happens if you omit content length. Recall that when I, when I showed you the example of the HTTP response message, we had a defined content length on it with a simple body. Now if you omit that content length, Node will automatically send a response header called transfer encoding chunked. And as you can see, we've got two additional characters in our body. These characters, if you look at them closely, are actually hex size indicators that indicate the size of a particular chunk. This is a particularly powerful feature of HTTP 1.1 and Node that's called chunk transfer encoding. And we can verify that those are indeed hex by looking at the output. So for instance, if you do parsent D in 16, you'll see that it equals 13, which is indeed the size of the first chunk. The second chunk is simply a zero byte chunk that node sends along to signify the end of the response. So the HTTP spec prohibits mixing transfer encoding chunk and a defined content length. You cannot stream chunks for a response that already has a fixed length. So once again, node handles this all transparently for you, so you never need to actually think or worry about it. Node, however, does not implement range requests natively, but you can use a third party library to do that. So we'll be looking at more detail into how these work behind the scenes and why they're important to implement. Next, let's look at content type and content encoding. Content type refers to the media type of the entity itself, whatever we're sending in the body, whereas content encoding generally refers to something like compression that requires additional encoding. Also note that transfer encoding, which I, which I covered before, is different than content encoding. Transfer encoding is specific to the server. It's, it's known as hop by hop, and it's only meaningful for one particular end link in that request response chain, whereas content encoding is applicable to the entity itself and is end to end. In other words, it's sent up from the client to the server or vice versa. It persists throughout the entire chain. So let's have a look at some of the the next element in the HTTP status line, which are methods. I'm sure we've all seen these basic methods at some point in our careers. Get and head are the most basic of them. According to the spec, every single HTTP server has to support these at a minimum. It can support others if it needs to, but get and head are the absolute minimum. Again, Node handles these transparently for us. Now, get requests are interesting. They can either be conditional, which Steve covered in his keynote earlier in the report for caching, or they can be partial, which is what we'll be talking about with range requests. So both help with caching. There's no need to download data that the client already has or just doesn't care about. And these mechanisms allow us to transparently circumvent that. So put actually, oh, sorry about that. So put indicates a modification to an existing resource. So unlike post, which is right before it, put refers to a URI that's already in existence. And as a result of that, this means that with put, we can actually do partial uploads as well. I'll cover that momentarily. But that's an interesting distinction that we see between post and put. So the next time you're reading about a REST API and you're curious about where post and put, post and put comes in, post refers to some sort of abstract resource that's going to handle whatever data you give it. Whereas put just handles 
the exists, whatever, literally the URI that you give it. And then there are some more obscure ones like, like options, which are used for cross-origin resource sharing, of course, there's AW3C spec about that, and trace and connect, which are really obscure and which we're not going to get into at all because they should only be aware of by the implementation. So, we've now reached our destination of ranges. First of all, there are different headers that are set depending on whether you're doing a request or response. In a request, we need to set the range header or an if range header if we want to do a conditional request. Remember, just like doing conditional gets, we can also do conditional partial get requests. So it's interesting how it works out. And then there's the content range header, which applies to a particular entity, and that a request can actually send if we're uploading partial content. So again, really useful. Whereas for a response, we can send any number of headers down. The first one is accept ranges. This is merely an advisory header that tells the client, hey, I support ranges, so you can feel free to make partial requests and I'll fulfill them. Now, because this is an advisory header, servers aren't required to send it. So you could have a server that doesn't send an accept range request and a client will attempt to make the request anyway and fail. Or you can have a misconfigured server that doesn't support ranges and yet sends down this header anyway. So this header is purely advisory and doesn't guarantee support of anything but it's considered to be good practice to send along anyway. Content range and content length are important when you're doing partial range requests. Content range, in this case, refers to the bytes that you're extracting on a particular file, whereas content length refers to the actual size of the chunk that you're extracting. These are obviously required because you cannot do chunked transfers or partial content, except in one very interesting case that we'll go ahead and cover later. And then date and the caching headers are as you'd expect for every other GET request. So let's look at the syntax for the range header that a request would set up. To get the first 500 bytes, you'd s you specify the unit, which in this case is bytes, the only unit that specs actually recognize, and then a range of 0 to 499. Remember that byte range positions are zero-based and inclusive. So the first 500 bytes is by our bytes 0 to 499. If you want to get the next 500 bytes, just specify the next range, so 500 through 999. Now, there's an interesting syntax for specifying the last 500 bytes. For the first type of syntax, you can simply omit the beginning byte range, and this will function as a negative sign. Basically, you're specifying that you want to get 500 bytes from the end of the file. So this is useful when you don't actually know the starting byte offset, or you don't fully know how large the file is, and you will trust the server to take care of that. Or you can use the standard syntax and just omit the ending, so say in a file full of um, 1,000 bytes, or 10,000 bytes rather, you can do 9,500 through the end of the file. So that's implied. You can also specify non-contiguous ranges. So you separate them with commas and you have a special syntax that provides them. And there is a way that you can configure the server to handle those and respond appropriately, which we'll talk about later. There's an excellent node library written by TJ Holochev called Range Parser that does, the handy work, that does the dirty work of parsing these ranges for you and giving you back an array of the different values. So you can go ahead and npm install that required in your app and use it for parsing range requests. TJ's library is also used in Express and Connect, which transparently handles these range requests for us. So we've looked at the request side of things with the range request header. Let's look at the content range header. The syntax of the content range header can only specify one particular range, sorry, no non-contiguous ranges here, and has to contain absolute byte positions. It's a lot more strict, which means that we can use a simple regular expression to parse it, and I'll show an example of that later. So a content range is only syntactically invalid if the last byte value is less than the first byte value, you can't have inverted values, or if you give it a range value that's greater than the length. So for syntactically invalid content ranges, the client, if you're sending down a response from the server, the client ignores the header and any content that you send along with it. So it's a really bad idea to send down malformed headers in general with or you run the risk of your client totally ignoring everything you send down. So the syntax remains the same for retrieving the next 500 bytes, for retrieving all except the first 500, and for the last ones. So as you can see, it's a very strict subset 
of the syntax used by the range request. So there is a particular error condition that the server can send down 416 if the range request is invalid. So for invalid range requests, the way that the server interprets them is only if it's unsatisfiable. So if you give it a range outside of the actual file size. If you give it a syntactically invalid range, then it gets ignored. So HTTP does implement some nice conditions around that to help you in case you do end up sending down invalid request headers. There's also a special type of response with the asterisk, the 416 response, that you can send down if the request range isn't unsatisfiable. And again, clients like browsers and the built-in Node.js request module know how to handle this transparently. So you're safe in the work of ever having to worry about this. But it's interesting nonetheless to look at how this occurs behind the scenes. I mentioned non-contiguous ranges earlier, and it's an interesting topic because what you end up sending down is actually a mean, is actually a MIME message with a content type of multi-part byte ranges. These look like email messages, form uploads, and any other type of multi-part uploads. Basically, boundaries separated, I mean, a boundary delimited string with the content, with the request, the data in between. So you can use this for binary values as an example. This is the request for, a, for the RFC 2616 text file, which defines HT 1.1. And there is one more thing that I'd like to cover, and that is partial put requests. I mentioned earlier that by its nature, put, rather than post, can accept range requests. So because the URI references the actual entity that you're modifying, rather than some abstract resource that takes care of handling this for you. So if the server doesn't support these, then it just responds with simple 501, again, standard HTTP semantics. But it uses the content range header, which, if you recall, is an entity header that can be set up with either the request or response whenever you have some kind of body. So in Node, we can actually use streams and regular express and combination of streams and regular expressions in order to parse any upload. Basically, we check for the request method. If it's put, then we look for the content range header. We then run the regular expression for the content range header. As I mentioned, because it's so strict, it's, it's trivial to write, or I guess it's just for it. If you see it, then we simply pipe the input of the request into whatever write stream target we create and specify a start offset as well as flags. So the flags in this case are particularly important. R plus means that we're opening the file for reading and writing. This is important because if you want to insert data in the middle of the file, you want to do so without obliterating the existing file contents, which is what create write stream will do by default, or if you have write only mode enabled. So it's very easy to get this to work in node, and especially with the power of streams. So finally, let's look at some use cases. The very first one is resuming interrupted downloads. If for whatever reason the download goes wrong, your connection drops, whatever, your client can easily pick up on it. And this is true for, as true for downloading a regular static HTML pages as it is for downloading media types. Which brings me to my next point, and that is retrieving large media files. So if you're familiar with the HTML5 audio or video element, you can actually, it actually uses this behind the scenes in order to retrieve that file. So, and this avoids you having to download wasteful data that the client will never need. For instance, let's say you're watching a YouTube video and you want to skip right to the middle of it. Your client doesn't have to retrieve the first half of the video and waste bandwidth and waste disk cache space in order to retrieve it. It can just make a range request for that particular part and then buffer it as you continue watching the video. The next use case are download accelerators. Again, you can open multiple connections in parallel and then once the file finishes downloading, you stitch it together. And finally, you can have much more granular caching for whichever file types you end up downloading. So on that note, I know that was a really quick primer. We have just a few minutes left. So I'd like to thank you for your time and turn it over to any questions you may have. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks very much. Thank you.